So good afternoon everybody. Today we'll be having a session on uh, stories of the glories. So this is basically a session to see how uh, people made it to where they are now, what journeys they took and uh, how they reached where they are. So I invite uh, the chairpersons and the moderators on stage and uh, since madam has come, we'll start off. We have uh, our speakers here, Dr. Debashish. We start off with you, sir. And Dr. Chityal is also there. Dr. Chityal. What is the first speaker? First speaker here is Dr. Debashish, followed by Dr. Chityal, Dr. Mahipal, Dr. Rohit, Dr. Arun Singhvi, Dr. Prashant, and Dr. Ravindran. <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you daring me, sir? <laughs> Anyway, I think the session was uh, conceived mainly to see how uh, the various institutions have reached a level where they have reached. And uh, we are grateful to all of them to, uh, you know, uh, agree to do this for us. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually uh, uh, targeted to the young ophthalmologists as well as to the uh, people who are trying to set up their own practices and uh, trying to know, uh, you know, what is, sky is of course the limit, but then just short of the sky, what is the limit? I request uh, Dr. Titiyal, sir, you're the chairperson, please. <laughs> also. <laughs> sir? And I also ask uh, the panelists to please uh, be part of the discussion. Dr. Amit, Dr. Fairuz, Dr. Jatinder, Dr. Kudlu is here, Dr. Somshila, Dr. Parikshit, Dr. Sonu Goel. I will have to leave in between because you will have to continue. Okay. So, Dr. Debashish, sir, are we ready? Panelists are there. I will be. I will be <laughs> yes, sir, please. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. And, uh, greetings from uh, Dishai Hospitals. Well, uh, when Columbus uh, sailed, he sailed to discover India. But uh, he landed up in the USA, the most powerful country. He didn't have much idea of what he was doing, actually. So much in life uh, occur more by default than really by design. So there were defaults in uh, my initial days also. I did not get the conventional government job, which was then the uh, norm, uh, because I argued they wanted a GDMO and uh, they didn't want an ophthalmologist. But then, you know, that hierarchical government system, I could understand that you cannot work where some, somewhere where you don't agree. So uh, that was the end of it. And uh, I started designing a clinic, a big clinic with retinal lasers at that time, 85, and uh, for free, did it for six months. But uh, when the big thing came, all the city big uh, doctors, they came and said this young lad can only be an RMO, not a consultant, which I was looking forward to. So just think, six months back, I had applied for a government job. And uh, six months down the line, and when I got that kick in the back, I somehow spoke out that, uh, see, man, I'm going to have a bigger hospital than what I have done here. So I didn't know how, but uh, it just I, it, it just spelled out of my uh, emotions. So then I was back to my hometown, which was 40 kilometers out of the city. And uh, there, you know, with the, uh, the optometrist name uh, uh, boldly written, but never mind, he was there for 25 years. So uh, mine, small MS, so fine. I was waiting for patients. 
and there was uh, this guy, you know, doing brisk business, a fuchka wala. <laughs> and I said that if this guy can do what he's doing, uh, I think we can manage going forward uh, because he was, fuchka was not important. Like he was distributing happiness. It was, I was observed, I used to follow him very closely. And uh, we all eat fuchkas. We've seen these things happening around us. But when you are in a tight spot, no, you start observing. So that was the beginning. So when you dream, I mean, Americans, they always say the big dream. The dream, I think, is uh, it aligns you to like-minded people. And uh, I, it helps you or prepares you. So when the opportunity comes, you see it much before the others. So I saw IOLs and I started implanting in 1988 and uh, free IOLs from uh, Appa Swami and uh, uh, all, um, I mean, it was given in such a way, my tributes to that great man, he left us two months back. We all in those times grew up on the courtesy of this uh, entrepreneur and uh, as happened those times, I was implanting more than 2,000 IOLs in within two, three years. Because of my location, because, you know, the entire West Bengal had a long tail, and we were sitting right in the goose neck, uh, I mean, before we, you enter the city. So location is a very important aspect, and what I learned is in your practice. And, uh, of course, these young uh, people, my friends, Dr. Basak, Tushar, and the two Tushars, they joined me, is to maximize me in my practice. And uh, the only thing I said, what are you doing in a government job? Come join me. But uh, the security of the government job held them back. So, you know, you say that, you know, a commitment, there was a commitment amongst all of us. And that invokes a sacrifice, which I don't think is a big word. It's just that you give away your initial posi your position of strength for a more efficient future. And so I left my practice, that handsome practice, and I, they left their jobs, and they were the best at that time. And it was not, you know, associating with subordinates. So we were associating with like-minded, uh, same uh, potential uh, doctors. So the journey went on, and this collegiality of doctors, they invited more doctors. So we had sir, a very young group sir. of great doctors from uh, this. Patients were actually at that time going to South India um, from West Bengal. So we had to rapidly do things, and uh, we had to uh, put in super specialities. We had to train because we we were inclusive model because we wanted that everybody should come to the hospital. Though we were participative, every patient has to pay. So we believed in one thing that, you know, cost is the first thing to quality because unless it is affordable, it's not there. Affordable is everybody, even a one lakh uh, charging private practitioner for a cataract surgery is affordable. Otherwise, how is he sustaining? But, uh, you know, it depends on where you are and that at attends your affordability. So, but once you scale, once you are inclusive, it is that, then you can scale up because if you are in that bracket. So actually, you know, we were doing SICS majorly till 2004 because we found that the cataracts were hard, the machines were not good enough, the foldable lenses were not in place, and uh, uh, maybe the money also wasn't there with my, our patients. But when torsional came and these uh, lenses became uh, better, the cataracts became softer, we went on with FACO. So there were certain conscious choices that we made. But we started Torix early, trifocals, and uh, OCT. We give an OCT for 300 rupees. We throw OCTs. We want to see the macula by optical coherence, as simple as that. So. <coughs> We believe that technology is for simplification, and uh, I think simplification is another word for sophistication. If you can soft simplify, you can. That is the ultimate sophistication. So, you know, we have optos for centers which see more than 500 patients. 
we again throw it a one almost 60 80 lakh machine for 300 rupees because we saw that the retina consultants don't want to bend their back to find a hole so it's it's the most thankless job that you want to do <laughs> so might as well you know put this machine at work yeah. and i tell you uh, technically speaking they picked up 20 percent more holes than the retina surgeon did actually so we are very fascinated we have six installations all doing well so also with pascal lasers and we have these theaters and uh, these are costly but uh, i mean if you are doing 3000 and for at least five years so 15000 surgeries it doesn't come to more than six seven hundred rupees per surgery so this is how the journey began began and you know we kept follow uh, following our following wherever we had uh, 50 patients we went on and opened a hospital because within uh, four years that would become 200 which was our cl critical mass of having a hospital right so uh, uh, we were first in the periphery uh, mostly in the mm -hmm. suburban areas and in the districts and then we in came to the city and uh, eventually now uh, we are there we are 18 centers and uh, we eventually came to the city with this big infrastructure of 80,000 square feet. And uh, so, I mean, we were, we had systems in place from 2003. Now we operate on a Azure or a AWS. We switch, switched over to AWS. So the staff growth is with, uh, you know, they grow as they learn multiple functions or they are uh, directed into training, taking charge of a particular uh, system, whether it be technical uh, technicians or uh, uh, registration, whatever, or they take charge of centers, they grow through the ranks. We don't have uh, people joining collaterally at the top with the uh, suits and uh, ties. So uh, the doctor's salary at the end, which is a very costly component, is actually a fee for service structure, uh, which depends on the we uh, encourage branding of doctors and uh, when somebody is a brand then he can choose only to see his patients and not disha patients so there his uh, compensations go double so uh, and uh, you know this is a fairly competitive model so uh, we have to keep av recordings in critical places like the inquiry or surgery fixation and obviously you know this lovely group of us still go on and some of these little children are now doctors so they will be <laughs> the next people for our hospital and that's the best part for me at this age so uh, post covid i think this is the amount of cataracts that we did all, all paying and uh, this is the amount of 5000 vr surgeries about uh, 14000 injections and uh, OCT, about the lack of OCTs, as I was telling you, between 17, 20 machines. And uh, uh, we do uh, also routine OCT for cataracts. So it, uh, eventually, it's about a two lakh OCTs that we do. So this is the growth of OPD. You can see the COVID dip. We saw 10 lakh patients. But we, yes, even in the COVID year, which we saw 10 lakh patients. So now, and. Uh, this is the growth of the surgery. Last year we did 81,000. And uh, so we are fairly comfortable revenue wise. So about 29-30% uh, on the bottom line to work because all that has you've seen, the pictures that you've seen are from internal accruals and from patients' money. So the next, we are trying to our hand on the multi-speciality space because we guided by our patients. They say that, sir, aankha to ho gaya, par ye pair tootta hai, ya TKR karna hai, to kaan jaye. So let's see if we can do something for the TKR patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, that was a brilliant uh, tale of how, uh, inspired by the Puchka wala, person who did not get a government job, made Disha and now we will have multi-speciality Disha. So if you do get a government job, then what happens? And that Dr. Titial is going to tell us the story of the glory, a true Amazonian right from MBBS. So uh, he's going to talk about RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences.
Yes, please. What happened to him? I was inquisitive to know. <laughs> that lies you know the aspiring India is there so and unfortunately you know they are in welfare schemes so you take them out from that welfareism <laughs> 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 Sir, the great uh, take-home message uh, sir has given today is I think once you reach to one level, I think uh, ophthalmologists also should think about starting a multi-speciality hospital. That was the take-home message he has given. No, Ajay, Ajay asked this question, na, uh, Ajay asked this question, how is it affecting them? It's, uh, not, it will not affect the Devashis, it will affect the other people actually. Because they start quoting that, wahan pe itna kam hai aur jada. issue becomes this. And in fact, uh, from my consideration, they will never be at ease because if they charge 300, the other doctor cannot, cannot charge. Okay, so, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you and good afternoon to uh, chairpersons, the uh, senior uh, people from EIOS uh, office and the dignitaries sitting in the front row and uh, my dear colleagues. Dr. Uh, Davis has talked about uh, Disha. He created Disha. He was himself there to talk about his institutions. I am a very fortunate, very lucky person to talk about something, some institution, which was built by a person uh, way back in uh, 55 years back. And person like me, uh, who was uh, nowhere at that time to speak about the institution, it's a great honor to me today. And uh, as uh, people say, I've heard a uh, movie, uh, uh, Saru Khan's movie, like his name used to be Rahul. They say Naam to Sunai Hoga. Similarly, RP Center, mm -hmm. everybody knows. It's been a, a pillar of uh, institution for the country. And uh, what to say about that? Uh, whatever I say is going to be a very small thing for a, such a great institute. Everybody desires to be in a, a greatest place for education. And India, as such, uh, looking into ophthalmic training, nothing bigger than that for a basic training, for a super specialization also. And uh, people have to be really lucky. And uh, one of uh, that uh, is me uh, coming from a very small uh, place of Uttarakhand. I would just uh, read a uh, few lines which we always publish in our uh, annual uh, booklet. Vision and far sight of one man developed a National Institute of Ophthalmology, thinking that it will be the forefront of eye uh, teaching, planning, research, and education. And that changed the department, which you all know at that time, the ophthalmic department used to be a very small one, clubbed with the ENT in one small room. He made it to a center. And that was a sea change, the concept of entire medical education fraternity to think the ophthalmic department can be a center. And that was a person named uh, Professor Lalit Prakash Agarwal. I think we owe to him, the entire country owes to him that he made this uh, type of culture. And this was a center to begin with. Things have changed so much, but our motto has not changed from darkness to light. And we always talk that uh, every patient coming to our center should uh, really get uh, light from his darkness not only uh, uh, vision-wise, but physically, mentally, ethically, spiritually, without distinction of caste, class, and creed. I think that is what uh, nations should talk about. For ophthalmologists working in uh, various places, why not in uh, RP Center? Always look into, uh, use your skills, which you have been imparted by education, to restore the vision of all people coming to you and give them a quality of life. Students come from an area where they have no uh, actual knowledge of uh, ophthalmic uh, scenario. Now MBBS has changed so much. 
in uh, in aims there hardly any exam for a ophthalmic uh, division so they directly enter into the uh, post graduation and our job has changed so much now in our time i had a colleague uh, uh, who had done you know one uh, year or a six months of house job manship in a uh, uh, hospital would have done 2000 cataract surgery before joining rp center so those are the uh, things which are not going to come back now teachers have a responsibility to really impart the skill to all the younger generation not only the clinical skill surgical skill but actually teaching the ethics and the correct way to practice for future and all paramedical and the staffs have to really work for the areas and this is what we talk about our mission is to really create a world class structure for our country where we can provide the uh, super specialized uh, care to our people by producing the super specialized people from the center because we do have a largest residency program we are looking for a i banking system which is which is going to uh, be uh, required in every corner of a country and a community care which is uh, beyond uh, i think at this stage also not reached up to the actual community area so i just going to take about few slides to have you reached that uh, or uh, thinking which rp center was created by the country at that time so there are three important pillars of uh, ophthalmic care and that uh, holds true for rp center also teaching research and patient care so i have reversed the slide because this was a mandate from the parliament that institute of uh, national importance all india institute of medical sciences will do teaching teaching research then patient care but unfortunately the things have shifted so much now we are doing patient care patient care and patient care and very little towards the thinking from the government on the research and patient and teaching wise but we are still uh, trying to improve those areas also these are the legends who created rp center i am just come up to talk about these people not only these chiefs of center who have devoted their life the faculty of rp center the staff of rp center and the people who have come from rp center they have actually created the uh, legend in ophthalmology patient care wise i think uh, this is at one very important slide right from the beginning of uh, rp center's inception dr agarwal thought about a multi specialty uh, working area look into different areas of sub specialties we have now more than 20 sub specialty in rp center to look into uh, right from a basic uh, uh, you can say cataract refractive to a uh, rop clinic now and these have really been the role model for other people to follow and the country has actually taken the lead and they have done that and actually this model has been emulated not only in this country the other countries also and this is how uh, we started from the basic surgery to micro surgery in dr madan mohan's time started a advanced di diagnostic modalities in uh, 80s subsequently dr dada who took up the area into uh, advanced modalities in the field of cornea refractive and glaucoma those are two area he considered would require a future expansion it is still true glaucoma requires a much more than what we have done then the uh, retina clinic also these are various labs which has been equipped with the uh, one of the most uh, i think uh, uh, effective utilization of uh, equipments people talk about why uh, institution uh, purchasing so many equipments we have so much a load of people coming to us as a uh, students they have to be given access to these these research labs have given us the uh, amount of research which we are doing in fact rp center aims has been a leader in a government setup for establishing all ultra modern things right from lasers retinal lasers examen lasers to name anything and now we are working on a community based areas for a low vision services to various areas giving a rapid assessment in a community in a various areas for which we can plan through the government to implement those things these are world class facilities which i think people sitting here uh, would say uh, it's difficult for government setup to create such a, a system but luckily uh, being a autonomous institution this has been possible to us and every year uh, our budgets keep increasing we buy equipments worth you know around 30 to 50 crores every year and not for a, actually for our patient care but it goes for a teaching and research which is important i always reply to people they ask why you uh, not uh, teaching uh, basic things i like to produce people who think for a future 
they take the country uh, uh, beyond what is uh, in a basic level. These are world-class uh, facilities we have. In fact, this is our uh, most uh, recent one for last four or five years. We have been doing brachytherapy in uh, northern India, one of the few facilities there uh, which is not available. And uh, RP Center uh, created this, which caters to a large number of a poor patient coming. And this is free of cost to most people. And this is the latest we have been doing surgery now of microscope digital surgeries. Imagine uh, we started with the intracapsular surgery with the loops and uh, uh, naked eye. Now we do again the uh, naked eye surgery through uh, polaroid glasses, seeing the screen uh, come back to same area. We started sutureless surgery, we're doing sutureless again. Eye banking is a dream for everybody who's working in the anterior segment. Started a year before RP Center was uh, uh, created and uh, we have done not bad in, uh, in, RP, in eye banking system. We have modernized the eye banking. We are looking for a, a centralized uh, community eye bank, if possible, in Delhi to where we can cater. And this is the ranking which every year we get uh, number one uh, institution in the country in regards to our patient care and teaching, mainly because we have a large number of uh, students. They are the best in the country, and they do a quite a good uh, work and research and the infrastructure which government has supported us. And I think. Uh, this particular slide is important. It was in the uh, early 70s, 71, 73, where first uh, survey of blindness was done through ICMR funding at that time. And this created the national program of uh, control of blindness and trachoma control at that time. Now it is known as NPCV uh, visual impairment. And 1976 was the first survey came up and that generated the blindness program, not only in this country, across the world. And this is the first blindness program in the country. Dr. Agarwal uh, had a vision and he deserves the, you know, all the accolades for this particular work. We had uh, been a part of a WHA collaborating center, eight center in the world. And uh, cataract blindness white outreach was earlier uh, approached. Now we have the patient coming to hospitals because of various reasons in that, I think, would uh, change the concept in the country also. Research-wise, RP Center is uh, very fortunate to be a part of a, a great institute, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where every facility can be clubbed. Now we have various institutions uh, in Delhi, like IIT Delhi and other research areas which we part. This is the last year's publication, just one year during COVID time. We had uh, 322 publications, uh, chaired sessions, and 538 papers been published last year, and uh, 96 funded projects are going on. The huge number of work goes in RP Center, and these are around 40 articles on COVID-related things also. And uh, if you look into our various uh, research areas, blindness was the major category. If you look into 1971-74, it was 1.38, the prevalence. Now in uh, 2019 uh, assessment, it is 0.36. So India has done well. The planning has come down to 0.25 by 2025. And these are various important, national important survey we have done for blindness and diabetic retinopathy. This is a trachoma survey we have done. And now in 2017, uh, with our uh, work across the country looking for a trachoma, it was declared that uh, active trachoma free is our country. We are doing uh, now work on a trachoma sequel uh, in looking to these areas. Teaching-wise, you all know we have the largest residency program in the country. At a given time, we have around 110 uh, junior residents doing MD and around 55 senior residents in a different uh, super specialties and around 55 faculty. The 200 is the strength of people working in our RP center in academic areas, apart from the other uh, areas. One of the best uh, thing I have heard from uh, my colleagues from different institutions the type of uh, postgraduate teaching in RP Center is totally different. The best side teaching has been the one of the major aspects of RP Center teaching, which actually takes the you know uh, learning from the the uh, uh, senior colleague to junior colleague within a fraction of a weeks. In within a week, the person is supposed to be expert in a RP Center. This is a surgical skill. I think one of the best uh, center we have in a country where we have absolutely ultra modern facilities for our training, which is important for all the medical institutions. And we have simulations, we have uh, wet lab training by GOATSAI, and not only for cataract, we have developed for all areas of thermic surgeries, and these modules have been created. 
and now every resident has to go through these trainings unless they get a certification they are now competent they are not given a surgery in a human eye these are all uh, workshops earlier in 1970s 80s we used to have a two weeks workshop in rp center in different specialty things have changed we are still continuing them and uh, that gives a uh, teaching for not only for our people from various parts of the country the short term long term training is uh, one of the major uh, attraction for uh, people uh, from various background in not only for government organization private sector also army is one of the most uh, suited area for us because they come for a more than two years training in rp center most of them are trained in rp center now this is one uh, slide i thought i'll show it our alumni people are across the world they've done wonderfully well they've created various institutions like rp center and they have served the various societies also i was just checking how many people are there in aios as president one of the largest number of people served aios is from rp center so we feel proud of that also so these are three pillars i talked about we have really achieved things in last 55 years uh, at present uh, i am supposed to be a chief and i feel very proud what our seniors have done i hope that we can put uh, another one block in rp center people might remember us teaching research patient care i would like to go in the same manner giving importance to teaching and research patient care will follow subsequently thank you again rp center in service for country for so many years we'll do it for another 100 years thank you again thank you sir it was a excellent talk uh, i think every ophthalmologist most of them sitting here everybody would have dreamt of uh, doing their post graduation or ug from rp center uh, you are telling uh, your overall motto is to teach the students i think you are part of most of the government committees also one request from our side that i think uh, when you are modeling because we nowadays pg is coming to the institute wherever they are doing the fellowship when we ask them have you done the cataract surgery sir my cataract surgery dekha hai aaj tak mai shuru nahi kiya sir after in 3 years so of post graduate you can send them to rp center they will do cataract yeah. surgery so since you are in a committees i would request you to formulate such a guidelines to the all the medical college that minimum number of this much of uh, teaching experience and surgeries they have to give to the so i think this is a request from our side sir no no i think the guidelines have always been there is there also unfortunately is is the uh, institution the uh, department they are not actually doing that which is supposed to be done the guidelines have always been there we can reinforce them and i was just seeing the one of the whatsapp groups uh, recently there a lot of discussion uh, on how to you know make the log books other things and they have been there i think you're right uh, we should insist uh, they should improve the uh, teaching area also thank you now another stalwart in the field of ophthalmology rp center alumnus uh, center for sight uh, how did we make it uh, professor maypal sachde thank you very much namrata and uh, thanks to tial uh, leaving from uh, where dr tial left uh, that's rp center and i owe, uh, owe a lot to rp center well i'll be talking about the journey of center of sight and uh, when you look at the journey of center of sight i will say that the most important thing is your education and your foundation that you have uh, that's me as a house captain of subhash house in modern school so what i'll say is that uh, what the school taught us was all round development to be a multifaceted personality and you need to have strong foundations and uh, your house will crumble if your foundations are not strong so there are uh, there is always uh, there are no i would say easy ways in life ultimately you have to have something which is rock solid and which is strong foundations so all i will say to youngsters who are here uh, is that when you are doing your studies whether it's uh, school whether it's post graduation whether it's senior residency make yourself rock solid and do not consider anything to be ye chhota kaam hai ye main nahi karunga even if you have to do a tonometry yourself or the topography or whatever it is please do everything because it all pays in life and i would say uh, 76 to 96 20 years uh, being in aims were really the formative years for us uh, uh, to get what where we are 
uh, for Centre for Sight. So having trained in the best of the institutions has been really lucky. And uh, ophthalmology was my calling and uh, Rishi is here, Professor Madan Mohan was uh, the chief at that time when I joined uh, RP Center. And uh, I think microsurgery was uh, something that Dr. Madan Mohan brought in and that is what we looked at. And uh, it is teachers and doyens like uh, Professor Madan Mohan, Dr. Enan Sood, Dr. Dayal, uh, Dr. Khosla, Dr. Tiwadi, you can name them. That is the greatest education in the world and that is uh, watched avidly by teachers and looked at what they were doing and how they were tackling different cases. But I would say that there is always a tipping point that a person has and I would uh, put my uh, tipping point to be my one year stint at Georgetown University from 89 to 90 where I went. And that is where I met this personality, Dwight Kavanaugh. Uh, so it is at this point that I realized that we were working on the first, uh, this is the first prototype of the confocal microscope and a uh, lot of papers are nowadays coming on mybography. And we had X number of publications, the infrared mybography we described at that time. So it is at that time when Dwight was thinking of getting a Nobel. Uh, he thought that he's working on the endothelium and uh, the confocal, etc., will get him the Nobel. So the thought process was so great that it set me thinking uh, that RP Center mein betha honga, malab, I was the youngest faculty of the five people. Uh, uh, Atul was my contemporary, he just retired. So maybe I, I was younger than him. Maybe instead of Titial, I might have been the uh, chief of RP Center this time. <laughs> But uh, that's about it. I thought that that is where I am going to be. But you would have been. If yeah. You would <laughs> yeah. have been there. Correct. So that's what I'm trying to say that, uh, yes, uh, I, that would have been where I would have reached. So, But I think that was not my calling. I thought that there was a need for a super speciality uh, hospital uh, or a center in North India. There weren't any in the private sector. Uh, they were all clinics, I would say, which were there and there was no corporate player at that particular time which was there. So the foresight was to build an institution for the future and move beyond cataract because cataracts is what people's bread and butter is and you get stuck on cataract and also to somehow <coughs> know the clinical business of ophthalmology. One important thing is that I had a clear ideology that we will build an institution and when you are building an institution, the first thing that I thought was that never become the rate limiting step by your own name. Because I feel that that is a mistake that a lot of us commit that we put Maipal Eye Center, then it would remain Maipal Eye Center because he wouldn't come to work with me or he wouldn't come to work with me because it, by the name, by the sheer name it denotes that you are working for Maipal. But if you are working for center of site or an institution, uh, Shankar Nitrale or an NN, it doesn't certify a name. So that is something that I thought. And what I craved was to create a platform for excellence and an, and an opportunity to lead with cutting edge technology, a super specialty team. That is the first thing that I wanted. It's the man that you have to get and the reputation and the strength of an institution. So I worked, started working diligently uh, and the purpose was much bigger than my own self. That is something very, very important that I wanted to get subsumed in the purpose. And we looked diligently. The first person to join me, I would say, from Ames was Dr. Harsh Kumar. Then we had Lalit Verma. We had Dinesh Talwar coming in. We had Professor Prem Prakash, Dr. Tiwadi, Pradeep Sharma. I can keep on naming. So we had a lot of people and we looked at the team. So when you start something, I would say that let us go to the drawing board. If you are writing a paper, it is very easy to write materials and methods. You can write the results. You can even write the discussion. But the most difficult thing, uh, Rohit will bear me out, is to write the abstract. So you need to put it only on a small piece of paper and not write a thesis as to what I am, what is my strength, and where I am wanting to go. So you need to do what is known uh, in managerial terms as SWOT analysis, your strengths, your opportunities, your weakness, and the threats that is there. And I thought that our strength would be to be outstanding, to stand out by having the best in every field of ophthalmology that is there. At that particular time, I would say the FACO phenomenon was coming 1991. Uh, and this is the, uh, that's when we started FACO emulsification. Uh, I think uh, we rode the FACO boom. Uh, 
I have had several discussions. Devashis is the testimony to it. I told him several times, switch over to FACO. I went to Disha and he said, no, no, I will switch over when the patient demands. I said, no, you have to make the patient see what are the advantages. And I think FACO has created center of sight uh, because it was FACO where uh, we excelled. It was a niche and there were, I would say, uh, if there were five people talking about FACO, there were five people listening about FACO. So there were so very few FACO surgeons. Harbans is here, who's one of the early adapters of FACO. So uh, what I will say, one of the things that has been in my uh, temperament is don't, don't be afraid to take the big steps. You can't cross a chasm into small jumps. You have to take a big step and the big step, I think, was uh, to go ahead and keep on acquiring technology that was there. And what I believe in technology is that your gut, your scientific acumen, your study has to tell you whether this technology works or not. And the first mover always, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would identify us with FACO emulsification because we were the first movers. Or if you look at refractive surgery, we were the first movers. Uh, this guy, as you can see, I don't know how many of you would know his name. So I'm sure none of you knows this name. So this is. Buzz Aldrin, and he's the second guy who stepped on the moon. Not the first guy, but the second guy. All of you would know that the first guy was Neil Armstrong, but you would not know that this is the second step on moon. So this is very, very important that if you think technology is working, you have to do that. And then sometimes when everybody is rushing into something, you need not be there. So what they say is when there is a gold rush, everyone is digging for gold. It may not be a bad idea to be in the pick and shovel business because the picks and shovels will be uh, sold. So you, you need to know as to where you are and what is the opportunity at that particular cost that you have. So team CFS, I would say that the best blessing that has been bestowed on CFS for which we have worked very diligently, having promised people double the salaries to give them an MG, et cetera, et cetera. We got the best clinical talent as partners. I think that has a big, big thing to do in center of sight. Even today, we are very cagey to uh, do uh, a collaboration, a merger, or something with a person whom we think is not clinically sound. Because a reputation that has been built over time needs to be looked at. So that is something very, very important. And doctor-centric models, I think doctors decide their destiny. Yes, there are MBAs who have come in, et cetera, et cetera. But I still think as promoters, uh, doctors still de decide the destiny of, <laughs> of center of a site. So the super specialty approach was there, cure and care. And what is very, very important is you don't build a business, you build people and then people build the business. This is something very, very important. So you need to have the right talent and the right people that is there, uh, great people that we have. And I would say that the power of the fist is something very, very important. As a leader, one has to get leadership qualities to get everybody to be in sync with the vision of the organization as to where the organization is wanting to go. And you need to constantly keep on working on yourself. That means you need to keep on working on center of sight to keep it going forward in every way and to keep the improvement going on. And there should be the broader goal of the institution. It should not be me, my, mera. Everything should be hamara. It is hum hai or hamara hai. That is something that we are looking at and that is what we want. You need to create a brand. I think that is something we have assiduously pursued that we need to create a brand. It's a lifelong time to create a brand. It does not get established overnight. There's a lot of money that you have to spend and then you get a brand recall. So you have to have an image, a mission and a vision. You have to have values which you need to have. And I would say whatever people may say, you need to actually reach out uh, in the digital age to tell people as to what you are, what are your specialities, what are the things that you have. And this is something very, very important. Benefits of a successful brand is that people would wish to associate with you. You give them a backup. You have a problem in cataract. Doesn't matter. There's a retina guy there. There's a glaucoma guy, etc. Brand recall is there. Assurance of quality is there. NABH, etc. All those and speciality, super speciality is there. One thing that we have talked about is technology. The second thing is always embrace technology and be futuristic. You have to be on a treadmill. You are on a treadmill. If you have to not be running constantly, you will go back. So there are these things where your technology needs constant upgradation. And when you have a chain, you have the advantage that you have the best technology at a tertiary hospital. If it becomes slightly 
semi obsolete or whatever it is you can actually put it to a, a smaller center and shift it and you can buy new technology so that is the forward education as uh, dr titial talked about i think that is something that we have uh, we have long term short term fellows dnb etc now we have something that i was passionate about we have the r and d we have done uh, fta trials now for a uh, couple of companies and that is something very very important so my sum up that i will wish to say is take risks but the risks can be calculated success is an antithesis to taking risks if you don't tis, take risks no gain no pain there is going to be no gain that is something very very important a uh, lot of people are kg about private equity i don't think that is something because there is a value to money and you need the money to grow and you need to have some thought process on that particular thing as i was saying in this very hall yesterday there are 27 private equity investments that have happened in ophthalmology over the last 6 years maximum in any super specialty that has happened so there is lot of big money that is coming into ophthalmology and i'm sure that this consolidation which is going to happen that is there uh, this is center for site 19000 this is the fructification of the dream that i left uh, aims for which is there today we have more than 53 centers across uh, 13 states that we have important thing kaizen this is one word that i believe that's the japanese word kai and zen that is change constant change is inevitable and change would be in small incremental steps it's not that overnight you will be able to uh, take uh, rome was not built overnight so you have to do change and change for the good that is something very important no shortcuts there are no free lunches in life work will work when nothing else works so you have to be passionate about your work even today at 64 i am possibly the first to come in cfs and the last to leave i have about 12 to 14 hours grueling schedule and you need to have your people who need to do in hard work and that is something very very important for you to get accomplishment you have to set goals and the goals have to be on your being better than what it is but nothing comes without discipline i think uh, this is something very very important that you need to ingrain with your people that is there so finally i just wish to say whatever i have said what abdul kalam said this resonates with me Just you should stand for a culture of excellence the re excellence not by accident it is a process where an individual continuously strives to better oneself the performance standards are set by themselves they work on their dreams with focus and are prepared to take calculated risk and do not get deterred by failures as they move towards their dreams then they step up their dreams as they tend to reach the original targets they strive to work to their potential in the process they increase their performance thereby multiplying further their potential this is an unending life cycle phenomena culture of excellence they are not in competition with anyone else but themselves that is a culture of excellence i am sure each one of you will aspire to become a unique with culture of excellence to get the unique you is a big battle the battle means you don't need to take a gun the battle means you have to have four unique things four unique tools you must have in that battle a uh, one is you have to set the goal the second one is acquire the knowledge continuously and third one it's a hard work with the devotion and fourth is perseverance question is whether you want to be you or everybody else so friends with that i will end and i think all of you should give a dream which will be the biggest thank you very much Thank you so fantastic uh, journey I think uh, the full hall speaks uh, for itself where everybody has come here to see these uh, fantastic journeys of each of the institutes next uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr Rohit Shetty he will uh, talk to us about uh, NN's journey so far There are no questions I think after uh, <laughs> Dr Mahipal speaks uh, Uh, nobody can question him and uh, i think uh, i still remember till the time the laptop is on 
I when he left, I said, "What is the need to leave?" leave? And he said, "No, I want to create an institution bigger than RP Center, just in front of it." And I think that is going to happen. But then, uh, kudos to you, sir, for for dreaming this and then for doing this. Any questions? Oh. No, no, I understand. The point is that uh, that is where, that's what I said uh, in between, there is going to be strong consolidation. That's where money power is going to be. Uh, we are in the service industry and we cannot do burns. That is the biggest problem that we can't do burns. But then you have to have to be strong in digital. Uh, you need not, I'll just give an example of a young chap in Delhi. Uh, who is doing more than 600 eyes of LASIK. Uh, and uh, yesterday there was a post on the Facebook that he has run 100 eyes in one day. Okay, so we were, uh, we were numero uno in LASIK in Delhi, uh, but today we are number two. And that is the power of digital that somebody has, and you don't need to join a practo or anybody, anything like that. The digital power is here to stay, and you have to invest proactively in the digital power. You have to be very proactive. I don't know whether you want to join a practo or a pristine. I, I will not. I will do it on my own. So there has to be a digital presence that is there and you have to have your own app. You need to have patient appointments. You need to cut down patient times. This I talked yesterday. There has to be a lot of investment at present. We have invested four to five crores on our IT and on digital that is there and it's going to be a long haul. That uh, I would not join somebody, but I will uh, definitely be uh, putting a lot of money for digital myself. What about those who don't have that type of money? Uh, join us. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I told her once, that uh, the problem is that when you are done a neurosurgery or you've done a cardiac surgery, you never thought of starting your own clinic. It is unfortunately uh, that the barrier to entry has become so high in ophthalmology earlier. Aap, jase aapne bhi ICC ki honge, torch leke, you could actually start uh, an OPD for ophthalmology or do that. But that barrier to entry has gone up. So I think the mindset of younger people to start their own clinic will change and it is changing. It is changing and I am telling you, you, you have now a TPG invested in Agarwals. You have a General Atlantic going to invest in GA. You will have somebody investing in us again. So these guys have big bucks. Money is an important thing that is going to be there and I think you have to invest and an individual practitioner will not be able to invest. There is a case for people to join big institutions and you will see that the growth you are seeing already that the growth of bigger institutions is more than single practitioners. So that I think is a reality you cannot shake away. So uh, I don't know Gantu, that's something you uh, need to uh, look and take care. Yes. What we've been seeing is everybody, like all, 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 everything comes down only to evaluation. Uh, the, the promoters, they, for example, they, they create something. They, by themselves, the revenues and the profits are not there. No, no. Even for Amazon, sir, it's that. the biggest. That they are doing on GMV. I'm not talking about their valuation. I'm talking about driving traffic. You're talk, I'm dri talking about driving traffic. I'm not talking about valuation. That's something I different. Yeah, yeah. I think it is going a That's little a in a different different territory. So we now would request Dr. Rohit Chetty to you. tell his story of the glory of Narayan Netrale. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you all thank the you. seniors uh, for inspiring us to reach to this stage where uh, I'm giving a talk on behalf of uh, my chairman and the watchman for the last who have finished the journey with us and who are continuing with us in the last 40 years. So uh, I will skip things which are uh, not. Our philosophy has always been, and uh, even though it looks like a slide which has come out of a, a philosophical <laughs> test book or a quote from somebody, this has been the foundation of what we have done and why we are here today at this point of time. When our chairman started his clinic, his clinic was half the size and the challenge with us is we had to change the mindset from a clinic to an institute to a state where we are in. It's very, I think, I don't know, from uh, speaking from the other side, it might be easy uh, if I listen to the stories from say L.V. Prasad or Shankar Netra, and the vision was to create in the day one that you're creating a 
the institute or what it is today to compare to ones where you have to start from uh, from a clinic like uh, what sir mentioned to change the philosophy from a model what we have uh, what we started to something which we are today this has always been the philosophy in everything we do whether it's clinics or uh, work it all starts with curiosity so what have we what are we proud of in the last 40 years we started and most of it remains still the same we might add more roots to it i think the strongest philosophy is how you create the roots when the roots are strong then everything else becomes easy ethical care stand by it even today integrity the trust which we and are the the line which uh, we have put it outside our hospital is your faith shall heal you i think that's a probably the biggest thing the patient feels happy when he comes inside the hospital and it's printed in every logo of ours your faith shall heal you so that means you're trying to tell them that you have faith in us and a care and that itself will heal you research and uh, progressive vision is what i'm going to say uh, 20 years back when i started i i'm finishing 20 years today half the time of what nn was started i met uh, dr devi shetty who's part of an organization uh, sister organization in cardiac care he said only one thing your future is not an extension of past so if you're going to do exactly the same thing what people are doing today, you'll be completely outdated by the time you reach 20, 25 years. So he gave me only one advice, that every five years, go back and think and do your own analysis and see what you're doing is going to be the future or it's going to be complete obsolete. And that's what I keep doing. And, and today, in 2022, I look at these things which would probably change everything. I don't want to go too deep into this. It's all in the website. People have spoken about technologies. And the most important thing is to have the vision of a child, you know, the wonders, and how these things can create changes through education and to something totally new. People before me have spoken about how you have to take that risk. So the biggest risk I had to take was to explain people why a complete private institute wants to do get into research when you know that it's not going to feed you money? Why do you want to pump in? And today, even today, I don't have an answer. I wish I had one. So at that point of time, we were very clear, if you want to bring research, you have to bring in research, you have to bring in serious research to this country, you have to make clinical, serious clinical researchers. If you don't have clinical researchers who are serious, then it's not going to work. And I started, and Chaitra is here, and lots of people. Then we changed to the next level that we were the first to give a complete direct PhD fellowship program. Universities in our state were not very keen. They thought we were going to make money out of it by selling this degree. So I had to go out of country to start giving it. PhD may be just an extra comma to your degrees, but what it changed is the mindset of thinking changed. And uh, me and Chaitra are here in this room. We never thought like this when we were, we were also doing work. I had already published close to 100, 120 papers when I got my PhD, before I got it. But the last 150 odd papers were completely role defining. And half of them are completely clinically translatable today. And now my vision by 2030 is to have at least 70% of my clinicians reach this stage. 70% of them should have a core area. If I ask Dr. Chaitra or if I ask Dr. Anand or Dr. Pooja or Natasha, what's your core area of work? You can't say I do research on cornea. That means you are not core areas. If you don't have a core area of work, then you can't call yourself researcher. You should say I'm working on endothelial cell regeneration. I'm working on uh, ERMD and uh, new biomarkers. So that is a philosophy, I think, which we are proud of, not only in this and every single thing. The jack of all trick and master of none is an completely outdated principle. If you're not able to master one, it doesn't matter even if you are, if you are, if you, if, even if you are jack of everything, it just doesn't work. And these are the few people. And the second big area of work we started doing is, uh, Dr. Heels, Dyserfield, you know, basically, 
there's a huge amount of stress among each one of them. One big area we want to really build is to view a productive work culture. There are a lot of my own residents out here who are part of all these programs. It brings in tremendous changes in their own personality and philosophy of work has to be starting with your mental health. And mental health is one of the biggest challenges doctors are facing. And this has always been there as part of our philosophy. Then we went to building up a grow lab, which I'm very proud of, last 14 years now. Start and in, a, in a better format, I would say 11 years. When you get this thing done, the philosophy is what are you really getting into? It has to be translated. It has to be translated. If you can't translate something in the next five years, then you're wasting your time. You can't say it will translate in 50 years and you have, nobody has time. It has to see a result. So you divide it into different zones and you divide it into short-term, long-term and really long-term goals and start putting clinicians. What I request all of you is, if you don't, as clinicians, if you don't get involved in it, the scientists will only be doing this. They don't know how it's translated and we clinicians do not know how to get this into the clinics. So one of the biggest trend of us has been that we try to translate whatever has happening here and push the scientists to meet with the clinicians. And that's the only way I think the research can work in this country. I just rush through all these things. You don't. So what is the future we create? This is, I just heard this very nice uh, lesson from a person who runs a very big school, the franchise of school, uh, called Delhi Public School from the whole of Karnataka. He said, and his son is my classmate, and I think that's such a profound uh, impact on me just a few days back. He said, if you're an employee of your school and his children join the school at the same level as he is, like if it's an attender and he becomes an attender, after your school, after your, after your training and other things, that means you're schooling and you have failed as a leader. So what we try to tell our clinician is if you're trying to do exactly the same as what a leader is doing, then the hospital and the whole philosophy has failed. So I tell my fellows residents that you have to do it completely different from what you are doing. And this is my teaching to all my residents. Just because your mentor or teacher does it doesn't mean that that has to be copied because what I'm doing today in next two or three years or five years is completely obsolete and anybody else can do it. And this is what has been said. So what's the future? What I see in the next five or 10 years is trying to get into the vision of unknown. And this is my dream, not my, when I say it's my, it, 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 it represents the entire from the chairman to the watchman. Because if I, they don't have the same principle or philosophy, it will not work. And I end with this uh, talk with a statement because you need a strong philosophy from the chairman to watchman because if the even the watchman is not in the same league as you are in your organization, things don't work. And the best statement was when John F. Kennedy asked somebody when he was going out before the man went to moon, he asked the, he asked the doorman, what is your work here? And his answer was, I'm sending the man, I'm sending the man to moon. And that day he said that this mission is going to be successful because if the doorman is the same philosophy as me, there's no way it will, it will fail. So make this the philosophy, whatever philosophy you have, make it sure that it reaches every single person in your organization, including your driver. And then you see the difference. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Rohit Shakti, for creating such a wonderful institution. We all are proud of you, the type of research your team has been doing and actually making whole country really proud because uh, of course many other institutions do copy and paste and have some thesis and other things but your research are really original and it's uh, really very very great thanks for bringing your institution to such an a level the whole of the country feels proud of you thank, thank you, you dr Rishat. dr rohit uh, one question so of course as uh, dr arban slal said that i think only the, your main motto is to justify, uh, find out unknown things. So one request from most of uh, ophthalmologists, uh, you do a lot of research, I think you have to start a special course, how we do in fellowship, 
only how to make a research project for a short term sort of fellowship one month course how to become a researcher i think that is going to become india will have a more and more research thank institutes thank you okay thank you now i invite uh, dr prashant garg from adi prasada institute thank you chairperson and good afternoon um, all the participants uh, i'll be talking about uh, lv prasada institute by summarizing what you have heard so far i think one thing that we have to remember as an ophthalmologist as a eye care provider our vision is to eliminate needless blindness I'll begin with the story of this lady who was stranded at home because he was in an area where no eye care was available and family could not take her to any hospital till our community worker approached this family and brought it to our secondary center. This story really tells the story of close to 1 billion population in this world who have little or no access to eye care. In some way, LV Prasad Eye Institute's journey is to create a model that ensures eye care to even these remote rural areas. In a way, trying to reconcile not just the goodness of the health, but also the fairness in accessibility of the health as well. LV Prasad Eye Institute is a not-for-profit organization working toward preventing needless blindness and vision impairment. It was founded on October 17th, 1986, and we started seeing our patient on June 1st, 1987. Yesterday, we celebrated our 35th anniversary. Starting as an advanced tertiary eye care center, in 35 years, we have not only grown on the Banjara Hills campus in Hyderabad, but today we are present in more than 250 locations. The beauty of the model is that these 250 locations are in a pyramidal model that allows interconnectivity of the care from remote rural areas to the center of excellence. We are not just the clinical care providing institution. We have today 10 functional arms. These functional arms are education of all cadres of eye care personnel, helping other institutions in their capacity building, rural and community eye care, vision rehabilitation, research, eye banking, technology innovation, product development, and advocacy policy planning. The clinical care spread from community screening to the treatment of advanced and complex eye diseases, as well as rehabilitation of those who are suffering with incurable blindness, including giving them financial uh, skills that allow them to lead life in a respectable manner. We are involved in training of all cadres of eye care professional, not just ophthalmologists, right from a front desk staff, ophthalmic nursing assistant, vision technician, and optometrist. We have well-established basic science laboratories that are uh, helping connect the the, the bench side to bed side and then in community, including the most sophisticated research tools. The iBank in our organization 
has made a significant progress and today we are one of the largest supplier of corneal tissues all across the country. We are consistently collecting more than 10,000 corneas every year and close to 6,500 corneas are used for corneal transplantation. 40% of these corneas are made available to ophthalmologists within the state as well as elsewhere in the country. We started our journey into the innovation, particularly of the products that are either not available in the country or are very expensive. And in that attempt, we are now creating products that can be made available at a much lesser cost. We recently started our BioNest, where we are going to be collaborating with the startups who are interested in developing products that are of importance in vision care. In last 35 years, we have touched lives of more than 34 million people. We have uh, 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 distributed more than 69,000 corneas. Uh, uh, more than 2 million surgeries were performed in our network. Uh, we have published close to about 4,000 papers in research uh, of various uh, 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 literature. 56 PhDs awarded and we have our services provided in more than 12,000 villages. The impact that the organization has made in last uh, 35 years is close to 22,000 plus eye care professional trained from LV Prasad Eye Institute and we have helped upgrade several eye care centers. Uh, Dr. Rao was pioneer in helping creation of Eye Bank Association of India. Our group established eye, Indian Eye Research Group uh, strengthened Indian Journal of Ophthalmology through Dr. Rao and Dr. Das, put together international groups for improvement of education and spearheaded the US-India Research Collaborative Initiative. If we look at the impact that we have made internationally, close to 3,000 plus eye care professional from overseas have been trained with us. We have been uh, the Secretariat of International Agency for Prevention of Blindness. We have also been partner with International Center for Eye Care Education, International Association of Contact Lens Educators, and created models of uh, uh, the eye care programs for many countries. We are also a WHO collaborative center and a global resource sensor center for uh, Vision 2020, the Right to Sight Society. Very recently, uh, on the request of the government of Liberia, we initiated an eye center uh, in, in, uh, uh, in that country. The primary objective of that center will be to catalyze, uh, 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 to act as a catalyst for sub-Saharan Africa. The first batch of resident from that center has passed out last year, and that has helped us begin the journey of helping Liberia in creating their own human resource. Overall, through our supporters, through our alumni, we have presence all through the globe. In recognition of the work that we have done uh, in the year 2020, we were awarded Greensburg Prize. From our institute, our three members of our team have been awarded Padma Shri from the government of India. We are very fortunate to have colleagues who were successful in receiving Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award from government of India for their research work. And the report that was published last year from Stanford University about the top 2% researcher, six of our colleagues were listed as uh, 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 in that list of 2% best researchers across the globe. In addition, there have been several awards and recognition for our team members. In 2020, uh, there was a decision to uh, uh, hand over the responsibility of running organization to a new team. And through a very fair process, that team was selected. And I was given the responsibility to leading that team. 
So what led to the success of the organization so far? And I think if I have to summarize the factors that have helped us succeed, it will be the visionary leadership in the form of our founding chairman, Dr. Gullapalli Nageshwar Rao, a very committed team committed to the cause of eliminating needless blindness. Trust of all our clients, be it patients, be it trainee, be it reserve, uh, researchers, or be it the philanthropist. And support from all around the globe in the form of time, talent, and treasure that we enjoy. The second important factor that has been pivotal in the success of our organization is this pyramidal model that came out of a very well conducted scientific study called Andhra Pradesh Eye Disease Study. And this model is allowing us to take eye care into the remotest rural areas while at the same time connecting them to the top of the pyramid. It is because of this pyramid that we are currently involved in eye care right from screening to the management of most complex diseases, making eye care uh, an appropriate eye care available in these areas at an affordable cost and a model that allow them having access to eye care all through the year. I'll tell you this another story of a young girl who came to our vision center and was diagnosed to have white reflex. The vision technician immediately did the teleconsult with ophthalmologist and where the diagnosis of retinoblastoma was made. This young girl was then sent to one of our tertiary care center in Vijaywada, where the advice of enucleation was given. The family got devastated with this thought of that one eye will be removed. The team of vision center coordinator and the doctor at tertiary eye care center made sure the family is made aware of the disease and its consequences and finally could convince the parents to undergo enucleation and chemotherapy and save the life of this young child. With rehabilitation is the third pillar that ensures that we complete the circle. All the people who are diagnosed suffering with incurable blindness or vision impairment where we cannot offer care or cure from blindness through our medical knowledge or, or practices are taken through the process of rehabilitation, not only to lead life in a respectable manner, but also to ensure that these people get the financial security. There are some best practices in the organization. We are a value-based organization and every employee is expected to abide by these values. These values are excellence, equity, integrity, togetherness, and above all, patient first. It has been a mission right from day one that we are going to be reconciling excellence with equity. Patient belonging to paying and non-paying category will be treated equally. The other best practices are attracting and promoting merit and talent and providing opportunities for career building. These three people came with high school degree and today they are pursuing PhD program and have grown in the organization. We keep pace with the technology but at the other end also do not neglect technology in our vision center. We have 63 vision centers which are technology enabled, connected through internet and have all the modern equipments available to them. We were the first one to adopt electronic medical record and this electronic medical record mm -hmm. is built in house. Today this EMR is 12 year old where we have done more than uh, a, a million uh, uh, consults every year. The other thing that we have done is that we have always been open for national and international partnership and have participated actively in all the national and international programs that are working for elimination of needless blindness. These are in addition to a robust HR policy and a financial Dr. Prashant will you please? Yeah, sure. Financial decision making. 
financial discipline such that all the jobs were secured or protected during COVID and everyone got their salary and increment on time, even in pandemic. In summary, LVPI is a commitment for a mission supported by visionary leadership, committed team and partnership. LVPI's structure is based on robust rationale that facilitates this mission of eliminating needless blindness so that all may see. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Prashant Garg. Now I invite Dr. R.D. Ravindran from Arvind Eye Care Hospital. And uh, we are very proud of Alvi Prashant Eye Institute for training wonderful ophthalmologists and uh, giving super specialists across the country. And then we have got the another institution which is doing unparalleled job in the training and community ophthalmology. So good afternoon. I think we are running kind of late of time. So I, I'll try to you know, cover this in the Thank you, sir. quickest <laughs> possible time. <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about Aravind IK system. As you all are aware, I mean, Aravind was started by Dr. G. Vengatsami. So Aravind was started by Dr. J. Vengatsami and he was you know, driven by the vision of eliminating needless blindness by providing compassionate quality eye care to all. So that is what you know, really drove Dr. Vengatsami. So he converted his uh, uh, 10 bed eye clinic, you know, which was uh, into a Aravind eye hospital. It was really a coming together of five private practices of Dr. Vengatsami, Dr. Nachia, Dr. Nambarumal Swami, Dr. Srinivasan and Vijay Lakshmi, <coughs> these five practices came together to create Aravindai Hospital as a not-for-profit charitable one. So even when there was not much money, Dr. V went on to start the free hospital in the year 1978, even though a, a, a large loan was taken to start the hospital at that point of time. So that was his passion to serve all. And today, what was started in 1976 with 11-bed, today we have about seven tertiary care centers seven secondary care centers, about six community eye clinics where the doctor and the team examines the patient and provides outpatient thing. And we also have 100 primary eye care centers. As together, about we are exist in about 120 locations. In addition, we also have about eye banks in four locations. And we collect close to about 6,000 to 7,000 eyes every year. And we also have a basic science research institute named uh, after Dr. Vengat Swami called Dr. G. Vengat Swami Eye Research Institute. We also have started a Lions Aravind Institute for capacity building of other eye hospitals in India and also elsewhere, and oral lab, which was started in 1992 to provide affordable surgical supplies to the world. And uh, today we have about 6,000 staff and trainees work at Aravind and another about close to about 1,000 people work in oral lab. And uh, during this period, from the beginning until now, Aravind also has produced about 1,000 plus postgraduates. About 1,600 people have done their specialty fellowship. And uh, clo about more than about 4,000 people have done their short-term training anywhere between one month to three months. I'll just share you know, what, uh, know how we were able to achieve all of this. I'll just basically share the principles that went on to build Aravind. I'll go one by one. So one is the most important one is how do we make eye care accessible to all? So I'll read through this. The core of this vision is providing comprehensive eye care to all regardless of their ability to pay. So that is one first principle. The second principle, it also holds up a larger vision of searching out and then serving the patients who need of care. The people who are not coming to the hospital, how do we look for them and give them that care? Third is, it is in, in line with the universal health coverage as a national goal, and it's also the goal of the 
the World Health Organization. So how we implemented it is we enabled access to the hospital. So the hospital services open at least about 10 to 11 hours. There are no appointments. Anybody can come for outpatient visit or for surgery. We had a paying section and a free section in each of our 14 hospitals. So all of this was done to lower the threshold for access, which is a major problem for the patient. So even though we had a free section, only 25% of the patients coming to the hospital were you know, utilizing the free services. This means you know, the people only in the areas very close to the hospital come, but whereas the paying section attracts people from all over. So as a result, we started eye camps that provided comprehensive eye examination and also comprehensive care, which means you know, we gave prescription for medicine, we dispensed the classes in the camp. We also took patients who needed you know, surgery or to the hospital and also facilitated for those who needed the specialty things. So it's not just relating only to cataract. So, but whenever when we did us uh, you know, understood the effectiveness of these camps, we found only seven percent of those in the villages where we do the camp come to the, I, 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 the to these camps, and not everybody. So that led to the establishment of the Vision Center in similar model like what LV Prasad has done. Here again, you know, we provide comprehensive services, including provision of glasses and medicine, and they get to do a teleconsultation with the doctor. So on an average today, every day, we see about 3,000 patients through this network across this 100 centers. The second principle that drove Aravind was the quality and continuous improvement. So the core of this pillar is the quest for perfection. High quality has been a tall pillar, a defini defining character of Aravind since its inception. We track the infection rate, visual outcome, the patient satisfaction from day one. It's a factor of growing importance is monitoring continually improving both the quality of outcomes and other factors which contribute to quality. So this also means that Aravind remains as a learning organization. So the way we have you know, implemented this is we have defined the, the, uh, the quality. All of you know there are about six aspects of quality. For example, the safety, we have defined what we'll do for quality so that the patients get it. Now if there is a deviation, how this will get reported? And we also, to monitor the outcomes of surgery, we have established registry, what you've done is cataract. We are also establishing similar ones for glaucoma, trauma, and also for retinal surgeries and uh, other areas. So we, this also has helped us to benchmark between our own hospitals, between our doctors, and also internationally about our outcomes. And the third aspect is, it's about patient centricity. So this is interesting because this value is concerned with the process of answering two questions. One, what the patient wants. Other one is what the patient needs. The first one, you know, what the patient wants requires thinking like the patient and what will satisfy him. The second requires thinking like an ophthalmology, what will improve his eye health. Probably a patient may come for a, a pair of glasses, but you find a suspect eye disc. Now you need to investigate for glaucoma. So the patient may come for a similar, you know, he thinks he's got a cataract, but actually he's got you know, a diabetic retinopathy. But you know, convincing these patients, making sure that they get what, they, what really is needed. And we need to do this in compassion and in a manner that also respects the dignity of the patient. Here again, we have created the goals that will define our service quality. And you know, just to monitor, understand, you know, we have created all these goals. But on a continual basis, if you want to you know, improve, we need to have uh, discussions with the patients. We have call feedback centers to call at least you know, about 5% of the patients who come to the vision center to a secondary hospitals, 1% to 2% of the patients coming to a tertiary care centers. There is a team of about 25, 30 people work on this. And all the feedback is also shared with the doctors and the other staff. The fourth aspect is about frugality. The core of this value is we don't waste resources. So we emphasize good maintenance so that we keep our cost low. So if you have to serve a large number of poor patients, the cost also has to be kept low and we have data to support if you want to go to the alternate. The similar mindset also applies to the patients. We make sure that the patients don't have unnecessary treatment or unnecessary investigations, no unnecessary return visits, no unnecessary medicine. So the whole principle is don't waste the patient as well as the hospital resources. 
And in order to be frugal, we also make sure that you know, the whole treatment is completed on the same visit. So earlier, we used to give a prescription in the camp, and only 25-30% of the patients used to buy the glasses, and it used to cost a lot. But today, we have on this site, you know, dispensing of glasses nearly to 85%, and, you know, they are able to get it only half of the glass, you know, half of the price. So, you know, otherwise, there is a cost of visiting, you know, going back to the optical shop, bringing back to your doctor to check all of that. There's a lot of other costs. Similarly, uh, the vision center really saves a large amount of money for the patients instead of coming to the hospital because only 10% of the patients who come to a vision center need to come to the hospital either for a surgery or investigation, but 90% of them are able to get it. Again, you know, if you diagnose a patient with a glaucoma or a diabetic this is a great way to follow up these patients. And uh, the fifth one is being self-reliant, uh, finding a way. This core of this pillar is building the capacity to do what is right. The principle is that Aravind will continue to draw from outside individuals and organization, but not become dependent on anyone and will cherish the capacity to make its own. So now the, all our hospitals have been built, the income generated by the hospital. And again, you know, you need the HR has been the major challenge. So we have been training people right from beginning all the MLOPs the started right from the day one the start the the training also started today we've trained close to about 9500 people the ophthalmology training started way back in 1982 the postgraduates the fellowship started in 83 and we, we also felt the managers are important that again started in the year 1987 and again no research is also important if we have to solve the problems and the diseases we are facing in India, we need to have our own research and this is led to the setting up of this research institute. And we also now you know, really encourage our doctors to understand, do the clinical research and do the publication, which has been slowly increasing. The other important thing is how do you really take care of the, the staff? Because the, the core of this pillar is the staff pattern. It rests on the belief that uh, when a staff needs are considered, they will respond most effectively to create synergy between individuals' aspirations and organizational goals. So we made sure, make sure that uh, their career progression is taken care of. And there are a lot of welfare measures, including uh, a spiritual retreat. We allow them to go for a week or two weeks to any anywhere. That leave is given and their cost is also co covered. The last aspect is about sharing. The core of this pil pillar is, you know, if you want to really uh, eliminate needless blindness, you cannot do it alone. So you need to do it as a team. So we share our best practices with all the other 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 organizations in the in the world. So uh, that is the reason for creating the Lions Aravind Institute of Community Ophthalmology in their 1992. So today we work with nearly about 29 countries and 354 hospitals and uh, who contribute to close to about now million surgeries in addition to what Aravind does to eliminate needless blindness. So to conclude, I mean, to, to sustain the organization growth, we really work on three, three values, which is maintaining the transparency of the organization, maintaining the equity, and also making sure that the organization remains empathetic and compassionate. And again, the other important thing, we work on with all the staff, only if the staff are aligned with the vision and mission of the organization, the organization will continue to grow. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ravindran, and uh, uh, sorry for getting late. And now I invite the next session. And uh, uh, what I call as a three big institution of the country, because whenever there is a fellowship is taught, Asin, Arvind, and LV, they have created a really wonderful ophthalmologist and given a very good care across the country to our.